The linked 1D 2D approach to modelling has become a standard method for much of the FUD modelling undertaken for FUD studies such as FUD mapping. In this session I'm going to talk about how you can build your 1D 2D linked model with FUD Modeler. I'm going to start by saying a little bit about 1D and 2D modelling individually, then talk about how you can link the two together to get the best of both worlds. I'm going to talk about the methods for actually linking, forming the links between the 1D and 2D domains that are available within Flood Modeler. Then I'm going to the main part of the webinar, which is a live demo, building up a 1D and a 2D model from scratch, linking them, running them and looking at the results. So let's start with a little bit of background about 1D and 2D modelling. So on this screen are four sort of schematic diagrams of different uh, representations. The top left um, image shows you a 1D model that is modelling only the in-channel part of the, um, of, the, of the river and floodplain. So it's just the in-bank part. If you move along to the top right here, we've now extended those 1D cross-sections across the floodplain. So it's a 1D model, but it's modelling both the wood the floodplain and the river channel. Now going down to the bottom left here, we've modelled the river in 1D and then the floodplain we're modelling using flood cells known as reservoir units in flood modeller. So this is sort of a, a pseudo 2D effect in a way. And then at the bottom right we've got an only 2D model. So it's 2D representation of cells in the channel and 2D on the floodplain. Now these are the 1D and 2D approaches have got you know, a lot of benefits individually um, and if you use linked 1D 2D modelling you can you know, take the best of both worlds for these. So we generally use the 1D for the channel, for the in-bank part of the river and for river structures and we would use 2D for modelling the floodplains and this allows us to capture the detailed flood routes around urban areas on the floodplain for example. So this is what it could look like using the same Scottish schematic as before. So we've got the channel modelled as nodes uh, with river cross sections, just the in-channel part. And then on the floodplain, we've got the 2D domain modelled using um, um, 2D methods using, in this case, a square grid. And then there's a, a line in this uh, picture, a red line, which represents the link line, which is how we link together the 2D domain to the 1D river cross sections. So when should we be applying 1D, 2D or linked modelling? Um, there's quite a bit of experience and judgment required to make those decisions, but here's some general points. 1D, because it's so fast to run, it's a good approach for flood forecasting. It's good at modelling in-channel water levels and flows. It's good at the bridges, the weirs, the other point features in the channel. And it can be good enough on the floodplain, particularly perhaps in rural areas or where the flow, uh, the uh, flood directions on the floodplain are quite easy to predict beforehand. So that's 1D. 2D is a bit the other way around. It's, it's really good on the floodplain because it can calculate what the flow routes are. You don't need to predict those, which you would do in the 1D. It also is, uh, it's quite, it, it is easy to set up, but it's relatively slow to run. Uh, but once you've set, set your model and you're happy with it, the um, flood maps and flood depth grids and this type of thing are direct out puts from the approach. So as I said, in generally flood forecasting 1D models are currently what are most what use most. Um, for flood mapping, particularly in urban areas, it's these linked 1D, 2D models that are the, the most common approach. Then for, there's a, a range of other types of studies, say operational control study, where you're looking at control loops on some sluices, for example, then it's likely that a 1D approach would be good for that because it allows you to do lots of simulations varying those control rules and probably you want to be looking at in-bank effects. When you're looking at uh, you know, design and appraisal of structural responses, you probably want to be doing 1D, 2D to give us uh, good flood depth information before and after the scheme for the appraisal, and you probably want to be modelling the river in 1D to capture the, the hydraulics uh, of what's happening and you know, particular structures and this type of thing within the river. If you're doing breach analysis, where we're putting a breach in a river embankment or wall, or you're putting a, a breach in a um, some some coastal defences, then a 2D approach is most likely to be um, most appropriate because you can it will then work out which way the water is going to flow across the floodplain. Now within Flood Modeler there's three basic approaches for forming the link between these 1D and 2D domains. There's a level link, a flow link and a weir link. So the level link, um, also called HX, is a way that the um, 1D model will calculate the water levels and it will set in the river and it will send those water levels across 
to the um, 2D solver. The 2D solver looks at these water levels in the river. It's already got information on the water levels in the floodplain. Um, and then it calculates how much flow goes between the two domains, either 1D to 2D or 2D to 1D. And then once it's done that, it then sends uh, information back to the 1D model saying how much flow it's going to be taken out of that 1D model. That's a level, a level approach. A flow approach is where um, the 1D model calculates how much flow is going to go between the boundary between the 1D and the 2D. It calculates that probably using in a flood model using spill units, which could be representing flow over a, a flood defence or a, a naturally high ground embankment uh, at the edge of the river. Um, so it then sends into the 2D model uh, how much flow is going to land in there. Um, and uh, the, yeah, the, the 2D model then spreads that um, through the domain. Again, the, the flow can go in either direction. Although this picture shows it going from the 1D to the 2D, you can also, using this approach, calculate how much flow would go over that embankment back from the 2D domain into the 1D model. And again, the, the, it's actually the 1D model that's calculating the flow over that embankment in the spill unit. The third approach is, is a bit similar to the sec to that second one. It's using weir type equations, but in this case, it's the 2D model that's applying these weir equations to work out how much flow is going between the 2D domains. So the 2D solver um, has elevations along the top of the, you know, the crest of the embankment, if you like. It's been, it's told the water levels in the river. Um, it's got the water levels in the floodplain, and it can calculate how much flow to send uh, either from the river to the floodplain or the floodplain to the river. So some of these methods, particularly the first two, can be used um, also when you're linking flood model 1D through to a 2D model. Now that's what I wanted to get some introduction out of the way. Now I'm going to switch over to um, showing the flood model alive and working through this demonstration. So what I've done here is I've started with a completely empty project. I've got no data in here. I'm going to start by loading in some uh, general data. So I'm going to pull in a background map and I'm going to pull in a uh, digital elevation model. So there we go. So that's the digital elevation model. It's actually a digital surface model, so it's capturing the buildings within the floodplain. You can see um, through here is uh, I've merged in the bathymetry for the river in here, and then we've got the floodplain, as I say, digital surface model, so it captures the tops of buildings. You can see that there's a few, there's a couple of bridge crossings there that, have, that don't appear in the bathymetry. Um, and then if I just turn that off for the second, so that's the aerial photograph we're seeing here uh, again with the river, the two bridges, and then the floodplain. Um, you know, with lots of buildings on it. Let's go back to the um, digital terrain model. So, the first thing I want to do is to set up my 1D model. So I'm going to build my 1D model from scratch. It may be that you've got your cross sections coming in from survey, but what I'm going to do here is actually create that um, 1D model directly from the bathymetry in this digital elevation model. So let's start by going into the map tools here and we're going to click on this new button here and go a new shape file and I'm going to create a, a polyline. Uh, got to give it a name. I'm going to call it um, river and then I hit OK and that's moved me into this edit mode. I click on the line button and then I'm going to click down the river center line as best as I can. Now, wherever I put one of these in the method I'm going to use later on to generate cross sections, it's actually going to generate a cross section at every time I click on the screen. There's a few ways of doing this, but this is the way I'm going to do it here. And then I've double clicked to finish and then I click stop edit and it's going to say, do you want to save that? Yes. So I've now got my river center line with a click at each point. I want my cross section generated. The next thing is to go into the toolbox and in the additional model building tools, 1D cross sections, there's a tool called um, cross section generator. So if I double click on that, now what this is going to give me a, a dialogue where it tells me I've got to tell it the shape file is only one, so it's already populated that. I need to tell it what terrain data to use. So I'm going to use that um, the dem we've got there. I don't need to use the next field because I'm going to ask it to. Uh, create labels automatically for me, all beginning with the letter R. Uh, it's got a default manage roughness in there. Um, I could have cross sections generated every X, every 100 meters down the model, but I'm not going to do it at each point along the river center line. 
and I'll tell it how many points I want it to generate um, either side of the center line. So I'm going to generate 10 points across the each side of the cross section. And then I'm going to tell it to expand, extend that cross section, um, let's say 40 meters either side of the river center line. So I know the river's about, well, just, just less than 80 meters wide uh, down here. So 40 meter either side is going to cover the extent that I want. Then finally, I need to tell it a file name to um, store things in, to store these, extent, these extracted sections in. So I'm just going to call that um, sections and let's hit save on that and then hit the OK button. And that's it. So it's now generated uh, these, these lines you can see on the screen here. Um, it's pulled out from the digital elevation model uh, points along those lines and it's generated it in this uh, what's called a .sec file, a section file format. So I could go and look at that it's, and it's an ASCII file, I could go and edit, um, edit it, I'll look at it in the ASCII edit of um, text file but I'm not going to do that, I'm actually going to go straight into pulling that information back into my model. So to do that I first need to start a new 1D model so I click on then create new 1D network and I'm going to call this um, 1D model file, hit save on there, and it's set up the basis of that, but there's no data in it yet. So I need to go over here and I'm going to um, go file, import model nodes, and I choose the .sec file format, and there we go, sections.sec. I hit open here, and it gives me a list of all the cross sections it's generated, these 10 cross sections. If I just drag those into my model, um, simple because I'm starting from scratch. If he's creating a model um, and you're doing it in little reaches, perhaps you want to set one of these up in, in turn and put them in the right place. Let's close that down for now. Um, and I think, let me just show you what, what the data looks like. So if I double click on one of these nodes here, you can see it's generated uh, an offset, an elevation, Z value, put in that default roughness we talked about, and it's added in the Eastings and Northings, the coordinates of each point around the cross section. So I click plot here, that's a plot of the cross section at this point, number four. Let's OK and OK out of that. The next bit I want to do is put some boundary conditions on this. I'm going to put a flow boundary at the top of this model. The top of the model is up at the, um, uh, at the point up here. So let's go and add in a uh, flow time boundary and put it right up here. And I need to give this the same label as the um, cross section it's going to connect to, which is um, cross section zero here. So I put put OK on there. It will tell me and uh, is it? It's telling me that that node where exists, and that's good news because that's what I wanted to put in there. I hit OK there, and we've saved it. So I put a, a QT boundary in there. For my first run, I'm actually going to do a simulation with a steady flow of 100. Uh, QMX coming through that. So that's that. That's that is that setup. Then the second thing I need to do set up this model is put a downstream boundary. And in this case, I'm going to put a, a normal depth boundary. Let me just set that down here. Um, and it's going to have the same label as the node it's connected to, which is 009. Hopefully, it should tell me it's connected. That's it. So what this um, downstream boundary does, it, it uses the Manning's equation, normal depth. To calculate a particular, calculate the um, using the cross section next to it to calculate the um, water level for a particular flow. I could get it. To, it needs a slope in there, and it could use the bed slope. But I know the bed slope is quite flat around here. Um, I'm going to actually set it to a, uh, a value of a one in a thousand slope there, and, I, and it will use the uh, uh, cross section immediately upstream of it. So if I hit OK on here, so we've now set up my 1D model. Um, I think I'll just do a quick simulation of that to make sure it's working fine. So I go new 1D simulation. Um, I'm going to call it steady 1D is the name of this, the file it, uh, the simulation. And then I just hit run on this. Um, and let's see what that does. So that's finished. Uh, and if I just close that for now. And then if I bring those um, calculated water levels into my model, I'm going to call them my initial conditions, my starting conditions for my unsteady run. So to bring them in, I go file, import initial conditions. That was the uh, run. Hit OK. And you, you may have seen there at the bottom right, it's updated all the initial conditions, which are, uh, in this case, the important things are the, the flow, which is 100 QMEX, and then the water levels, which are this stuff going down here. Um, so that's my starting model set up. I also want to set up a, an unsteady 1D model. So to do that, I could edit the one I've already set up. Um, 
better well I think I will do that actually let's go into the um, QT boundary again and this time I'm going to put in some more data so I'm going to put in a, uh, a quite a hefty very simple uh, triangular hydrograph coming in here um, which is going to go from 100 to 800 QMEX in uh, five hours so quite a steep thing here but it's uh, it will work for this demo hopefully um, so that's the the plot just that triangle uh, going up to 800 QMEX let's hit OK on that so I've now set up my um, driving conditions for an unsteady 1D model and I'll need to set up the simulation so I'm going to go new 1D simulation and I call this unsteady 1D and then I'm going to um, because I'm going to link it to my um, 2D model in a minute I'm going to use quite a small um, time step for this so that it's aligned with the time step in the um, 2D model. So just need to tell it that and I tell it how long I'm going to run for. I'll run for 10 hours, uh, save that. I think I'll run it now actually just to check that the 1D model uh, runs. It may not be very good because some of the waters should be going out in the floodplain but we haven't put the floodplain in yet. Um, so that's it, that's the hydrograph in going in and out of that and that, that's okay for what I want. I'm going to exit out of that and close that. Um, in fact, I think what I do just at this moment is I'm going to, because I know the um, the river um, is going to be, f the in-bank river is going to be full for this, I'm going to actually go and quickly um, set up um, the flood mapping within the river, because that's a simple thing to do. So to do that, I go into my toolbox, I've got in my favourites group of tools, I've got something called triangulate uh, selected file, and to double click on that, uh, set up a triangulation. Uh, which is that, so that's points of where it's going to convert from my point water levels from the 1D model into a surface, so I'm going to use the triangles to generate that surface. Um, I'm going to associate some results with that. Um, I think I'm just going to pull in the maximum water levels, which is what this do if, uh, this dialogue would do if I don't select any of your options. Um, and then, f so this, this is, the, you can see here, there's a slope going down the screen here is the water levels. Uh, drop as you go towards the downstream end. Um, very nice, but it's not really what I want to, want to do here. I want to produce a flood depth grid within the channel. And to do that, I'm going to go results, 1D flood map, and again, keep with all the defaults and just hit the run button. Um, 1D flood map, which will only be in the channel, so it's not going to be very interesting, but it, it looks nicer if I've got that on here. So that's it. So we've now got um, the flood depth grid within the channel. Uh, which is uh, you know, to be expected really here, because that's the extent of the 1D model. Now let's go on to do the uh, 2D, generate our 2D model. Let's just turn that off for the moment. So what I'm going to do here is, uh, for the sake of this demo, I'm just going to um, set up the 2D model for, for the um, for the lower part of the floodplain here. I'll only do the what's the right bank, in fact, this area down here. So to do that, I go into 2D build. Then I want to first generate the active area where I want to do the calculations. So I click on active area um, button and I call this um, active as the shape file it's going to generate. And then I'm going to turn sna snapping on. So what this is doing is it's making sure that I uh, don't have to be too precise on my clicks. So I'm going to get it to um, snap to the end point on all of these cross sections. Uh, yeah, that looks fine. So let's close that down. And now if I click on the polygon tool to actually draw my um, draw my shape file, snap to any point. Just check I've got that. I didn't mean any point. That should be uh, end point. I clicked the wrong thing there. Um, so if I now go into my, my tool and I can um, you can see that it's, I don't know if you can see that or not, but it's snapping to the edge of the cross section. Um, if I was doing this properly, I'd do this, I'd take a bit more time over it and make sure I go along the the you know, the highest point around the bank uh, in between these sections. So this is going to cut off a bit of the floodplain, I think, but it is fine for what I want. Um, and then let's just uh, finish the area off there and stop. So that's the active area that I'm going to, that I'm going to be using for my calculations. Um, I'll just turn that off for a moment so we can still see the den below. The next thing I want to do is do a, run this thing called the link line generator, which is going to generate this line which is going to be used to link the 1D and 2D models together. So I click on link line generator. Um, it's going to use the 1D model file as the network, so I don't need to do anything there. It's going to go from the first to last nodes, which is what I want. Uh, it's going to use the active area file. Uh, I don't. I can leave this den bit 
um, empty because I'll pull up elevations at runtime. I'm going to use a. This is where I choose the different types of um, linking method. I have a, a level linking, a flow linking, or a weir linking. I'll leave you at level, and I just need to tell it the name of the shape file I want to send these link lines to. So I'm going to call it something called link lines. It's a nice simple name. Um, let's save that and then click the OK button and it will generate the uh, link line. I, I don't need to do any more. So that's the link line generated. So that's the, um, let me just change the color on that so we can, uh, sorry, wrong button, change the color. Um, so it's a bit easier to see. Let's turn it into red, I think, in this case. Just make it a little bit thicker. Apply, um, okay, so that's that red line is the link line. I want to just check that it's set up the parameters correctly on that so I go at show attributes and then I look at these to make sure that they uh, they all work sequentially and we've got all of the cross sections referenced in there funnily enough it's actually uh, for some reason it's it didn't the, this bottom row doesn't seem quite right it shouldn't have gone back to zero so let's just delete that out of here so that is all of the lines generated I think so you can see the H in here is this water level link H for water level if it had W that would have been a weir link for example so I'm happy with that it's always it's important that you do check these um, link lines that are generated from the link line generator tool there are other ways of generating these link lines using tools in FUD modeler or doing it in other um, GIS systems that can um, write out a shapefile um, there we go that's the uh, link line generated we've got the active area uh, we've set up the 1D model. Now all we need to do is to set up the 2D model. And to do that, um, we go into simulations. I'm going to right click and go new 2D simulation. And I call it um, 2D. Hit save. And then it will come up with this dialog that I need to set up. So um, how long will we run it for? We'll run it for 10 hours. Uh, will it be a linked model? And I'm going to use that. Um, 1D simulation control file to drive it. Uh, we need to tell it if I've got any link lines, which I will have, so let's pull that across, just dragging and dropping the link lines across. Then we need to, if we can have, uh, for each of the domains, I only have one domain here, but for each domain we need to tell it some information. So we tell it, um, drag across the um, digital terrain model that it's going to use. I need to tell it what grid size. I'm going to set the grid size to 10 meters, because I know that will run quickly for this demo. Um, I'm going to use a time step of two seconds in here. And then I need to tell it the active area to use, which is that. And I leave the roughness on the floodplain at a relatively high value, 0.1. Uh, I could change that and you can change it spatially. But I think that is it. If I um, now start off the simulations, it would show that uh, running through here. So it's now running the 1D and the 2D model at the same time, dynamically pushing water levels and flows between the two models um, to get this integrated approach of simulating both the in-channel and the floodplain. Um, it's just about to finish, so that took whatever that was, um, some 17 seconds, 18 seconds. If I close that down, I won't look at the, I should be looking at the diagnostics to make sure everything was correct, but I won't do that now. Close that, and then um, let's just turn off the link line, put on the 1D flood map, and let's now pull in the 2D results. So I say view 2D results. Uh, I pull in all the information, which is heck, accepting all of the uh, default values. So I hit OK. And you can see there's bits, um, there's not much flooding in this case, actually, but there's, there's bits of water coming onto the floodplain. Um, let's see where that, what time that occurs. So... You can just you, so start from two to three hours. You can see some water coming on, and you can see down here uh, in these streets as it gets towards the five hours, you've got a bit more water coming in along this area here. Uh, and then, in this case, there's not many. Yeah, the water stays on the floodplain. The rest of it recedes. So if I just if I run through that again, started from time zero. So that's just within the uh, channel, and then you can see it starting to come onto the floodplain uh, about the. The peak is somewhere around here where it's come down these streets, a bit down here, uh, just upstream of that where we're crossing, and then a bit more up here. Um, and that's it. That's the uh, linked 1D, 2D simulation run. Um, I 
think I can go back to my PowerPoint, so I wasn't going to show anything within the software. So let's uh, pull back the PowerPoint and go on to the um, next slide, which is really a, a summing up of what we've done here. So within flood modeling, there's a place for both 1D modeling on its own, also a place for both 2D modeling on its own. But yeah, over the last, I don't know, X years, 10 years or something, linked 1D, 2D modeling really has become the most common approach, particularly for where you're doing flood mapping in urban areas. To form the links between the 1D and 2D models, there's a number of approaches that can be taken. Within Flood Modeler, you've got these three main, well, these three approaches of what's got a water level link, a flow link, or a weir link. And it's the same if you're linking from the Flood Modeler 1D to 2 flow, particularly that water level and flow type of approach. Um, are the, the, what you can use there to link to two flow as well as the 2D solvers that are in um, Flood Modeler. Now, because we've got the 1D and the 2D and the links through to two to two flow and all this geographic based uh, user interface together in one bit of software, you know, it really does give you some. It makes it, it makes it more fun to do the modeling. It means you can do things quicker and really get into the data and interpret it easier. And I, I think hopefully I showed you that through the demo I just ran. So I, I suggest that um, yeah, if you've got the time, if you're interested, give it a go. All of what I've shown today can be done using the uh, free version of Flood Modeler. It can also, of course, be um, run using the, the pro version, which allows you to build bigger models. But the models I ran today would all run within Flood Modeler 3. And with that, I'd like to say thank you and thank you for your time.